then hit record, please. Good morning, everybody. My name is Randy Hagan, and I lead technical training for North America for Bear. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. And uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy season uh, to join us for this great information. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping. We are using Zoom. Um, for all your questions, please put uh, those into uh, the Q&A. So if you have questions for the presenters on that, we will answer all of those at the end of the session uh, and ask those live. Uh, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A. We also, though, will be using the chat for one uh, for one. Uh, question that we're going to roll out to you so you'll be able to put some information in there. Also, the chat will be able to uh, give you some links and information throughout the presentation that will be put in there. If you're having problems hearing us, uh, if you go down by your mute button, either at the top of your screen or the bottom, uh, there's a little kind of carrot there and you're able to go ahead and make adjustments so you can hear us better. Um, there will be some polling questions. Those polling questions we'd like you to participate in and just go ahead and answer them. We'll give you about a minute to answer and then you'll also be able to see the results. If you are CCA accredited, uh, we are providing one uh, sustainability CEU for this session. If for some strange reason you uh, cannot get the survey at the end of the session, to go ahead and put your information in, or if you weren't able to put it in the registration, please reach out to uh, either myself, Randy Hagan, otherwise to, um, to one of your folks there and the Carbon Group, and we'll make sure you do get credit for, for CCA. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. We are uh, recording this session out. Uh, we will be providing the recording to you and uh, so you will be able to use that as a resource and listen to it again, and certainly for those that were unable to attend, um, but we are recording this session. Next slide, please. So our topic today is really about carbon and the opportunity about carbon and all of the different things that you can uh, gain from being in a, a bear program with carbon. Next slide, please. Our agenda today is really to talk about the state of the carbon market and how it fits and what it's all about and what's happening today. And we've got our global head of carbon operations for Bayer, Cornelius Streit. He will be uh, uh, presenting that part of our program. Then we're gonna jump into the foreground carbon program that Bayer offers and really talk about what are those requirements? How do I join if I haven't joined already? What's the eligibility and all that type of stuff? And we have Bethany Halls, uh, who's our Carbon Customer Success Manager. Uh, and we also have Alyssa Cho, who is our Sustainable uh, Agricultural Field Manager. And they're gonna be tag teaming that part of the program and really giving you that great information. At the end, um, Audrey Ball, uh, who's our carbon grower pipeline manager, is going to manage the questions that come in. She'll be asking those back to our presenters, and we'll make sure that you get all those answers. If for some reason we don't get to all your questions, or if there's a question that, you know, we have to take off offline one-on-one, -on -one, we will make sure we reach out to you. So uh, just know that as well but we are planning on trying to answer as many of these, if not all of them, at the end of the session. Okay, next slide, please. We're gonna jump into this thing with a polling question. And so the poll question is, um, as a grower interested in the carbon space, what practices are you doing today? And your choices, uh, you've got about four choices. I have been no-till, strip tilling, and or cover crop uh, for several years. Um, I just uh, transitioned um, to no-till or strip-till or cover crops this year or last year. I'm considering adopting a no-till or strip-till or cover crops in the near future. And uh, the last one is 
I don't know if I'm interested in these practices yet, and that's why I'm here. I, I really want to learn more about this and see if this is something that will fit on my operation or not. Um, so kind of kind of help get a little bit of a, a bearing there as far as what uh, um, what what will all come together there. So we're just going to give you uh, another five seconds or so. And we'll let you continue answering. I see we're still getting answers coming in. So let's do five seconds. All right, we can end the poll, Jareen. And so about 50% said I've been no-tilling and uh, and that for, for several years now. And um, about 30 some percent said, I don't know if I'm interested in this. I don't know what, what it's about, so I'm here to learn. And then we had a handful of people with answers for B and C. We can go ahead and stop sharing. And let's uh, jump to our next um, slide. So this one here, what we're gonna do is in your chat, you should have a chat little button there. Um, you know, what do you really wanna gain and learn from this session? Um, you know, is it is it something that you're just trying to figure out the interest? So if you could go to that chat and go to hosts and panelists and send your your little your message to us and just kind of let us know what are you truly interested in learning from this session? Is it uh, or is it something more specific that uh, we want to make sure that uh, we we have a good handle on? So an answer, I want to better understand what Bear is doing in the carbon space. Um, and so we're getting lots of answers in and how foreground actually works. Uh, one one uh, response, financial incentives and sustainability. That's a good one. How many dollars per acre will you pay? Well, that's, that's always a good question to find out. Um, Return on investment to the producer on adopting these practices. Uh, steps to the whole process from testing to payment. Um, I am a no-till farmer and know nothing about the carbon program and I wanna learn. I wanna know more about this and how, it, how, how I can gain from it. Uh, see if there will be options to enroll in South Dakota in the future. Uh, should I sign up with Bear Carbon or sign up with other programs? Uh, I can answer that. You should sign up with Bear. Um, I've requested a PDF form uh, of the contract. Uh, just curious again about the program. I'm trying uh, to learn about the carbon credit. How will it affect me long term? Trying to learn what benefits I'll receive. How are the GHG benefits tracked over time and who purchases them? Uh, pipeline concerns. Will all carbon programs be long-term contracts? Rules are changing all the time and wonder if we will get updates. So how do we get communicated to? Understand the program and if uh, there are practices other than cover crops and no-till. Lots and lots of stuff coming in, uh, Audrey and, and panelists. I uh, just want a general understanding of the program. What are the rules? Um, what are the handlers like bear making? Uh, uh, who has the best carbon program? Um, and then Audrey says, great, let's dive into it. So, <laughs> so I think that's a good move. All right, keep keep putting them in there. Go ahead, keep putting them in there in that, uh, but we will jump right into this and uh, start sharing this great information with you. And with that, we're gonna go right into the state of uh, the carbon market. And so Cornelius, I'm gonna hand it over to you and uh, you can tell Audrey when to move the slides. Awesome, thanks Randy for the introduction. So as Randy mentioned, I'm um, leading the carbon operations team here at Bayer. I'm based in St. Louis and I'm very glad to be here and good morning also to everyone. Um, the good thing first, or the good news first, right? Um, voluntary carbon markets are here to stay. And I think if we move to the next slide, we can clearly see what has happened over the past years. 
And many of you might remember the Chicago Climate Exchange back in the early 2000s, right? But which ultimately folded because it just didn't have the demand um, necessary to keep it up running. But what we have seen now over the past couple of years, and especially if you look at 2020 to 2021, voluntary carbon markets have basically quadrupled just in one year. And why is it so? I think um, if we ask ourselves the question, we just need to look at all the news coverage. Um, we need to read through sustainability reports of multinational companies. Basically, the majority of multinational companies have set themselves net zero targets, which means that they basically want to reduce or eliminate completely their greenhouse gas emissions by different timelines. Many of them pushing it out to 2050, some actually already looking at earlier, right, to at least um, offset their scope one emissions, which are the emissions happening in their own production by 2030. So if we look at the demand coming in from all these multinational companies to achieve their sustainability targets, we can actually forecast with quite high certainty that voluntary car markets will expansion, um, significantly expand in the coming years. Um, and then basically leading up to all the net zero emissions targets by 2050 which ultimately would require roughly 23 gigatons of carbon emission reductions. So if you basically put it into the perspective, you would roughly need probably 40 billion acres of farmland where you implement no-till and cover crop practices to get to this target, right? So the demand will be huge. So obviously agriculture cannot support the whole demand which is coming in, but we can play a really big role in helping the multinational companies to achieve the targets and hopefully also get paid a fair price for the carbon credits uh, which we generate. Um, if we move to the next slide, and this is giving you a little bit of a pricing overview, right? Because very often I get asked, so what is the carbon price? And I think the important point to note here is not that, uh, is, is that carbon credits are not created equal, right? We have credits coming out of forestry, which might be avoided deforestation, we have nature-based solutions, um, agriculture, soil sequestration, but we also have um, very new technologies like direct air capture. All are priced very differently, right? And probably the lowest um, pricing you can actually achieve for forestry credits today. And um, we can see actually that carbon credits out of agriculture are somehow in the middle here. And I think the um, top chart here shows you a little bit if you look at the top line here, which is called soil carbex. So this is basically an index which is tracking the pricing of um, uh, carbon removals basically through soil sequestration agriculture. So this is basically what we are always looking at and um, basically tracking also very, very um, carefully. What you can see here is actually that we had very nice um, upward momentum in pricing roughly until the beginning of this year. And then, um, things took, a, took the wrong turn, I would say, because this is when actually the conflict in Ukraine started. And many multinational companies, especially if you look at oil and gas companies, but often, even, even if you look at governments in Europe, the carbon emission reductions were not the first priority. It was more about um, making sure that people are not freezing to death. Um, and basically there was a little bit of a slump in, in the carbon prices, but we can actually see now that over the last couple of months, prices are starting to at least um, to be at least a little bit more solid and also slightly increasing again. And we believe that this will go up again um, going forward. If we look at the long-term outlook and this you can see at the bottom and there are different indexes tracked here. So the lower lines are basically red plus credits. So if you ask yourself, what is a red plus credit? It basically comes, it's uh, out of avoided deforestation, right? And probably it's, this is the lowest quality of credits today at least perceived because basically what we're just doing is we are not cutting down forests which are currently existing. Currently they are trading roughly at the $10 mark, but also here we believe that they, there's a significant increase in the coming years. If you look at a little bit more high quality credits and probably with, this is where agriculture is coming in, we can actually see that we are probably looking at prices around the $40 mark by 2030. So you might ask yourself, okay, so what does it mean? Um, especially if we look at all the players in the agricultural carbon market. There's a lot of um, pricing um, signals happening in the market. And we can see that most of the agricultural carbon credits today are trading somewhere in the $20 range, right? I mean, 
there's not really a lot of transparency in the market yet. So very often we also need to rely, for example, on news coverage, what other players are doing. But this is more or less what we can see the market is willing also to pay somewhere in the 20, maybe in the $30 range on the high end for agricultural carbon credits. So one might ask, why do we actually have the significant price differential, especially if we are comparing ourselves to forestry credits? And the interesting thing here is that many of the carbon credit buyers really are willing to pay a premium for potential co-benefits. We all know that um, no tillage and cover cropping can improve soil health. It can help to increase biodiversity. It can help to improve water quality due to less nitrogen runoff. And carbon credit buyers, many of them are actually willing to pay a premium for this. Plus also they believe that it's a more tangible uh, thing, right? Because they probably live somewhere close to a farm and know that, hey, um, farmer XYZ is um, basically doing cover cropping. So actually he's doing um, carbon sequestration on his farm. And I can actually really see what's happening compared to maybe some avoided deforestation, which might happen somewhere in South America, which is difficult to track, right? That this is really happening. You cannot see it with your own eyes. So I think this is the really good news that corporate players are willing to pay premiums for agricultural carbon credits, and they really see all the co-benefits which also are delivered with it. If we move to the next slide, this gives you a little bit of an overview who is really involved in the space, right? Um, so obviously on the left, the most important player here is you, the growers, the farmers, right? Because ultimately you will implement the practices on your farm um, and basically create the credit, um, which can then basically be um, translated via um, verification, um, via also doing the necessary soil sampling and they, they basically quantifying the emission reductions um, and can ultimately then lead to uh, the issuance of a carbon credit by a global carbon standard registry. So there are a couple of registries out there. The most known probably is VERA or um, Climate Action Reserve. Um, they are basically ultimately issuing the credits after basically we go through all the flow, right? You see a lot of arrows moving here between data, payment, and so on and so forth. So it's not just the grower and us involved in creating a carbon credit, but we are also looking at verifiers who are basically external auditors, I would call them. They verify that all the information is correct. We also have soil samplers, um, basically because we need to ground proof some of the modeling which is done. And then basically, ultimately, the carbon registry can issue then the credits, which are then basically sold to potential credit buyers. And I think here we had again the pricing. So yeah, roughly at the $20 mark, this is what we can see at the moment. Um, but we believe that there's definitely um, uh, um, a price premium uh, for agricultural credits also going forward. So we hope that these prices will increase. If we always talk about a carbon credit, there, um, I mean, just to 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 uh, make that clear, we're also always talking about one carbon credit is one metric ton of um, CO2 um, equivalent, right? So um, just to basically put the unit of measure here, what we are looking at. And we know that most of the um, acres here in the US can somewhere sequester. I mean, the, the bandwidth is pretty big um, depending on the soil type and the area you're in. But normally you're looking somewhere at um, 0.2 to up to one metric ton um, uh, CO2 equivalent per acre if you do basically a no tillage and also um, coupled with a cover crop implementation. Um, if we move to the next slide, and um, this is basically explaining a little bit what um, do carbon credit buyers looking for, right? And this is somehow also informing then our requirements for the carbon program which we have. So they are not made up, unfortunately, or fortunately. Um, we have to follow certain best practices to um, basically find the right carbon credit buyers at the end of the day. So every carbon credit buyer, they want you to follow a certified methodology. So they don't want that you are making up carbon credits. Um, there are clear methodologies, right? For example, um, the Vera, Vera methodology, um, VM0042, which basically deals with um, soil sequestration in agriculture. And carbon credit buyers are looking that you are following a certified methodology. Carbon credit buyers are also very concerned about the permanence of um, um, carbon removals, right? So they want to know that it's not just a one year off thing. They actually want that the um, carbon removals are stored long term. Um, 
which basically also kind of like explains why our carbon program requires a longer term contract um, because this is what carbon um, credit buyers are looking for. Then there's another requirement and this is mainly set by carbon registry, which is called additionality. So there are different additionality tests the project needs to run through. So one is the financial additionality, um, which means that basically the practice need to, uh, has been implemented due to the fact that someone is paying a fair price for the carbon credit generated. But there are also other additionality requirements. For example, Vera has a very strict threshold when it comes to common practice. But they say, if there's a large number of farmers who are already doing no to lock cover crop in a state or county, actually we see that as a common practice and are not able to issue additional credits to new adopters. So this is giving us a little bit of um, a time crunch here as well, because we can see that there are more and more practices implemented and adopted. And this additionality threshold gets closer and closer to us. So that's why we believe the time is now really to implement um, regenerative practices on the farm so that we are able to generate carbon credits out of it and pay then a fair price to you, the grower ultimately. Carbon credit buyers are also looking for transparency, right? So they want to know where is my carbon credit coming from? from um, are all the rules followed? Who is really creating it? Um, so they are always looking to have a lot of transparency, which I think is given in agriculture because it's very clear where the carbon credit is coming from. And lastly, carbon credit buyers are looking at an independent verification. And this is where this um, verif verification bodies are coming in, which is basically the external auditor who are, who are checking the data for completeness, for accuracy, and are checking really that practices have been implemented and that carbon sequestration happened. So this is basically the last step carbon credit buyers are always looking at. And all of this together, um, We'll explain a little bit the coming slides when um, Bethany and Alyssa are going through why we have certain eligibility requirements with our program and why is the program designed as it is today. It's all going back to ultimately what carbon credit buyers are looking for and what carbon registries are willing to, um, to accept from a um, practice perspective. So with that, if we go to the next slide, um, I think this was already my part here. So I hand over now to Alyssa and Bethany to go a little bit closer into our current program and our eligibility requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Cornelius, for setting the stage. And good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. So if you haven't already heard about our new uh, platform we're calling Foreground, uh, it's our new kind of um, overarching program that we've created that's really intended to help connect growers like yourself to opportunities, um, specifically new revenue opportunities like the Bayer Carbon Program around these sustainable practices. So I just wanted to highlight here, first of all, that um, this foreground opportunity is really intended to provide that support through different benefit pillars. So specifically around how can we provide you agronomic support to help with the transition or expansion of these practices on your farm? And also how can we bring forward uh, reduced cost barriers? So think of things like discounts um, on equipment or free field view plus subscription as an example. And then ultimately what we're doing with this is also opening it up for our buyers and creating not only these offset uh, credits, but also other opportunities uh, that rely on connectivity to the grower. Um, so we're excited about this uh, launch of this new platform. Uh, but again, today's focus is really on our carbon opportunity, which sits within the foreground platform. So our carbon program, we've been in the market now a couple years, and we really pride ourselves on being simple, flexible, and certain for the grower. And so what does this mean? What we do with our program that differentiates us is that we are based on practices. So rather than worrying about how much carbon you're actually going to sequester, we created our program based on practices. So again, we accept no-till, strip-till, and cover crops as our three practices. Um, and as long as you've implemented those practices, we've been able to collect the data and verify that you actually implemented them, we will uh, distribute a payment um, for the duration of the contract. We also ensure that it's simple, so there's no hidden costs. We don't ask you to cover the costs of soil sampling, for example. So anything in the validation or verification process, Bayer is going to cover that cost for you as part of the program. Um, so it's not included in the payment that we will send to you. 
We also have some flexibility and ease of enrollment. So we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get to specifics of the enrollment process, but really we're, we're allowing you based on your eligibility to enroll in the practices that you want by the fields that you choose to enroll. So it can be down to that field level for enrollment. And also we're committed to sharing in the upside. So as you just saw from Cornelius, obviously this market is new and um, ever changing, but we are committed to committing, passing on as much of that upside onto the grower as we can. So as those credit prices go up, we will continue to try to pass that to the grower. And if you are eligible for that increase, um, we also have no cap on our enrollment for a grower to enroll and our minimum is 10 acre enrollment. So now what are the implications kind of of what Cornelius went through and what I'm talking about here in terms of our actual contract that we ask a grower to sign? We do have kind of two of those quality requirements. So the first is that, again, we have that additionality piece. So carbon uh, must be additional to the baseline. So for example, it must be a new practice that's being implemented. And we also have permanence. So the permanence component is that we want obviously this practice to be continued so that that carbon can remain in the soil um, during the contract period, as well as during the retention period. We also wanna highlight the flexibility of our program. So of course, we're looking for a long-term commitment with the grower in this space. We're looking for a long-term impact of the practices that you're looking to bring onto the farm. But we do understand that things change and farmers are allowed to leave our program at any time with no penalty that we just ask for a notification in written form to us um, to let us know that you plan to uh, remove yourself from the program. We also understand that there's unforeseen circumstances where you may not be able to implement the practice that you enrolled with and we allow for you to skip practices. Uh, you will just not receive payment for the year in which you didn't implement the practice. And we also are looking forward to a possibility where projects could be renewed after the first 10 years, which could continue to generate credits and produce potentially produce rewards for the grower. Now there's two main components to our eligibility for our carbon program today, which are informed and, and created based on some of the um, requirements that Cornelius went through around the carbon credit generation, as well as some of what I just talked about. Um, so the first part of that is around the actual practice. So again, we pay by practice, and ultimately that's based on models to determine how much carbon could be sequestered under these practice changes. So right now we accept two main categories that would be no-till and strip-till and then cover crops. Um, in some states, we also allow for a combined, um, for both cover crops and then a combined no-till, strip-till plus cover crop um, offer. The main eligibility requirement in terms of practice eligibility is the date of practice transition. So this is really important. So right now, up until the end of this month, our eligibility goes back to October 1st, 2021. So if you've adopted a new practice in these categories since October 1st, 2021, you are eligible for the Bayer Carbon Program. Now these dates will shift once we move to a new calendar year. So I really wanna highlight this as we go forward that that eligibility window is going to continually shift as we move forward. Basically, we allow one year look back of historic adoption um, as our current Bayer Carbon program. We also have payment potential that's gonna vary by state. So the state level eligibility is kind of the next piece, but here I just wanna highlight, we basically have two offers which we've color coded um, with green and blue. So the green offer allows for that cover crop addition into the system. Um, and we have a 6 6 12 offer for those states. And then in the blue states, we are going to have a $5 offer and we're only allowing for that no till or strip till to be included um, in those states. We're also excited this year to have brought in a $6 per acre end of contract bonus for growers that are signing our current contract. And of course, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we are committed to evaluating the carbon market and the carbon credit price and our offer to growers on an annual basis. And we'll continue to iterate um, as we move forward. Also, if we happen to have any of our current growers on the line here, if you're looking at, ex if you're currently enrolled in a, in a green state, for example, you will automatically, if you're eligible, be brought up to the higher payment of 6612 um, if you fall within this eligibility criteria. Next slide. 
So the this map here is kind of illustrating where that eligibility comes into play. This is also, um, you can find this information on our website at bearforeground.com. And essentially what we have here is a breakdown of the states that we have for eligibility. So again, if you uh, remember that green offer is the 6612, the blue offer is the $5 per acre. Um, we have some caveats there, which you'll see with the brown and light green shading in some of these areas. But generally speaking, the states um, fall within those 6612 or $5 offer. Again, your, your state and county level eligibility is going to be another main component of whether or not you qualify um, or are eligible for the Bayer Carbon Program today. So again, the two pieces are really that practice, what practice you're implementing when you adopted it, and also where are you located um, down to a county level. Now, in addition to those two main requirements, we also, of course, have other um, criteria to understand whether or not your field is eligible. Again, eligibility is down to that field level. So you may have some fields in your operation that qualify for Bayer Carbon. And again, we don't require you to enroll your entire operation. You can enroll just at that field level. So right now we are only allowing corn, corn soy and wheat rotations. Um, again, we're looking at those two practice categories. So moving to no-till, strip-till, or adding cover crops in. The eligibility dates, so we already covered that. October 1st, 2021 is our current look back period for adoption of these practices. We're asking that you're going to commit to implementing those practices every year for the length of the program, understanding of course that we have that flexibility built into our contract, that if you are unable to do so, we understand. Again, the state level eligibility, um, we have a 10 acre minimum for enrollment of a field, but we don't have a cap on the number of acres or fields that you enter into Bayer Carbon today. We also have a requirement that you uh, must own the land or be able to obtain permission from the landowner in order to participate. And again, this is something that's across um, all, um, all carbon programs today. This is a part of a registry requirement. And of course, for us, we're asking that you are either a current FieldView user or that you plan to become a FieldView user as part of this program. And that's uh, for our process of collecting data and moving on to the next stage of the program, which would be post-enrollment when we start going through the data collection, verification, and validation process. I think I'm gonna pass it over to Bethany now. Yes. So <clears throat> once, so what as a Bayer carbon grower can you expect being enrolled in our program? So if you enroll today, you'll be a part of our foreground platform and all foreground growers receive um, and have access to what you see on your screen right now. So that includes a, fee, a free field view plus account, um, as well as early access to our data manager program. Um, and this really helps moving forward here um, with our data collection process, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Additionally, we have access to rebates through Orthman um, on strip till systems, as well as Soil Warrior um, from environmental tillage systems. We have some account rebates um, with them as well. Um, additionally, we have a continuum egg regen roadmap offer. Um, and our team is really committed to adding additional offers um, as we move forward here. So Alyssa um, alluded to um, slightly, there are requirements for, for participating in the Bayer Carbon Program. Um, and I'm gonna break those down just because um, we really wanna be transparent in, in our work within the program and, and what it takes to really be a, a science-backed program um, and to create quality um, credits that we can um, then market on a carbon market and then share that value back to you as the grower. So uh, one time only, unless something changes um, with your, you know, personally on the farm, you would fill out a W-9 form. So that essentially gives us the ability to pay you um, if you have verified practices in the program. This is done electronically via DocuSign 
Um, and again, it's one required per contract. If you prefer, we also have an EFT form that just allows you allows us to pay you faster. Otherwise, it'll come um, in a check form. And then um, data collection. So there's a several components included with data collection. That includes field photos of practices implemented. So this past year, um, we actually had a field team go out and help with these field pictures. Um, and really it was just, hey, like here's um, the residue in my field or here's the cover crop um, growing right now. So that's really what that looked like. Um, next, we have practice evidence documentation. So this might be something like um, your strip till machine. This might be cover crop receipts, something that says, hey, I am doing these practices. So that was number two. And then historical farm management. And this moving forward will be done in Climate Field Views Data Manager tool that I, I mentioned before. Um, but essentially what we're doing is the year that you changed those practices um, will look three years um, back from there. So if I flip my practice um, to no-till or strip-till in the year 2021, we would look back at 2019, 2020, um, and excuse me, 2018, 2019, 2020, and then my practice change year, which was 2021. Um, so we're really looking back and trying to establish a carbon baseline um, three years prior to that, that practice adoption. So that is what our data collection process looks like moving forward. And then each year at the end of harvest, you will have what's called an annual attestation. So this is around seven or eight questions. Um, it comes in, also comes in the form of a DocuSign. And like I said, this is required annually um, at the end of each crop year. And then as Alyssa mentioned, this is standard across all carbon programs, but you, if you are enrolling fields that you don't own, you have to obtain a um, signed landowner authorization form from each of those landowners um, that you would be enrolling in the, in the carbon program. Um, so that's really what it looks like to participate in the carbon program. And this will be done essentially starting in, in mid-January um, through the end of harvest next year. So what we're trying to do is really break it into bite-sized pieces moving forward so that you know at the end of harvest next year, we're not trying to do um, a larger list for you um, as our, as our uh, carbon growers. Um, so right now, if you enroll by um, the end of December here, you can get up to a $2,000 bonus. If you see that QR code on your screen, you can go ahead and scan that um, or check out the, the chat. And Audrey is going to put in a link to our website to um, if you wanted to begin enrollment or check out your enrollment to see if you're eligible for the carbon program, you would receive this bonus based off of the acres that you enroll. And then if you do end up having qualified um, verified acres um, in the carbon program. So you can go ahead right now, um, foreground is actually free to enroll and enjoy all of those benefits that I talked about today, um, including that field, free field view plus subscription, excuse me, um, equipment rebates. And then um, we also have uh, free agronomic services like Continuum Ag, as well as we have our own team of sustainable systems agronomists that are here to help you, um, whether it's expanding your operation, with these practices um, or for first time adopters. So go ahead and check out that QR code or the link within the chat. Great, thanks Bethany, thanks Alyssa. So now we have one final poll question before we get to Q&A. Um, I'll introduce myself briefly here too. I'm Audrey Ball, the Grower Pipeline Manager. So contributing to the grower program team with Alyssa and Bethany. But we'd love to know after today's session, how you're feeling. Uh, so if you could finish the sentence for us. After today's session, I learned a lot about the program and either you're interested and would like to sign up, 
you're interested but want to learn more, um, you're not sure at this time but would like to learn more first, or you're not interested at this time after learning more. We'd love to know that so we can reach out to you if you do want to learn more um, and, and see how we did with the session before we dive into the questions. So we'll give another 10 seconds or, or so. Okay, Doreen, if we see it um, slowing down, we can share the results. Great, so quite a few are interested but want to learn more. Most or the, the, the largest folk are not sure and would like to learn more, so we can help with that. And then a few are not interested at this time, but this is great feedback for our team and as we go into questions. Awesome, so let's dive into the Q&A. We have a lot of questions that have come through, so I will um, try to get to them all. Again, if you haven't put them in the Q&A function and you put them in the chat, if you could move it to the Q&A function, that will make sure we get to your questions. Otherwise, I'll go back to the ones in the chat at the end if we have time. So let's start with uh, this first one. Uh, with the planned CO2 pipeline, I think this is for you, Cornelius, will this reduce the need and or eliminate the need for carbon credits to the farmer? Yeah, I think it's a good question. So, I mean, ultimately, I think what we can see that there's still significant demand coming in for voluntary carbon credits. So it doesn't eliminate the need to also create carbon credits, for example, from agriculture to fulfill this demand. I know that there are a lot of um, activities also um, yeah, CO2 pipelines, you have um, big um, direct air capture projects coming online, but at least for the next 20 to 30 years, I would say there's still significant demand, which cannot be filled alone by all these new technologies or um, other means and where agriculture can play a huge role in providing the necessary credits. Great. The next one is, I am already doing cover crop and no-till. Are there any payments for using nitrification inhibitors and urease inhibitors with my nitrogen applications? So I might give back to Alyssa or Cornelius. Uh, so not today. Uh, currently, our practices are only including the no-till, strip-till, and cover crop. Great. Next one is, are credits from Bayer's program sold as insets or offsets? Cornelius. I mean, yeah, I can take that one. Um, so basically our carbon program, which we just presented with eligibility requirements, this is solely focused on carbon offsets. Um, we are actually putting more and more inset programs online. And this is also for growers who are maybe not in eligible states today. That's why we encourage you to sign up for foreground because we are working with value chain partners who are um, interested in inset programs, which might actually be also outside of the states which we have um, currently mentioned as eligible for our carbon program. So that's why there's a real benefit, even if you don't qualify today, to still sign up for foreground because we will help to make this new um, inset programs with value chain partners visible to you. And we'll let you know, right, once we believe you're a good fit, um, it's in the same county or state, and um, we'll contact you then. So that's the whole idea about around foreground as well, so that we can basically match also some value chain partners with you ultimately for inset programs. Perfect. Um, and I'm not sure if we can answer this one, but I'll pose it anyways. Um, who is Bayer using as the boots on the ground soil sampling verifier? Yeah, I mean, we are working with different providers and we are looking at also consolidating a little bit um, going forward. Um, so all um, providers which we are working with um, are fully accredited and the labs um, have the necessary certifications in place. Um, so yeah, we are working with several soil sampling verifiers um, at the moment and looking at how to also improve that going forward. Great. And someone asked, did I hear correctly that Bayer is helping with the cost of soil sampling. Lisa, do you want to reiterate that point? Yeah, it's just um, as part of our program, that cost is covered as our program expenses. So it's not passed on to the farmer in any way. 
So the soil sampling requirements that we do, um, we, we cover the cost of that. Perfect. Um, a couple of points of clarification have come in on if a grower is planting cover crops and already no-till farming, they're not eligible for this program, correct? So if we could clarify that switch date, um, we also had one question on, I've been no-tilling since 2000, am I eligible for the carbon program? He didn't mention if he's doing cover crops, but if you could clarify again, Alyssa, what the criteria are for switch date. Um, yeah. And yeah, so our current requirements are that the practice is a new practice starting on or after October 1st, 2021. So what that means is that this practice would have been implemented in the 21 or 22 growing season for our current contract. Now, if you've been doing a practice like no-till and you're in a cover crop eligible state and county, you could still sign up for the cover crop only offer on top of your existing no-till practice. So you might not be eligible for the no-till payment, but you would be eligible for the cover crop payment as an example. Um, and again, you can kind of check out what your specific eligibility is by going to bareforeground.com, linking your FieldView account um, and answering a few questions about your fields to figure out whether or not you're eligible. Um, I hope that answered that question. Also, if you plan to implement in the next year or two, we'd encourage you to also reach out because again, we can help with that transition. Um, and again, you would still be eligible for that new practice adoption in the, next, in the coming year. Great. And quick clarification on crops. Is grain sorghum not included in this program? Currently, no. Yep, so just corn, soy, and wheat at this time. Um, this is probably for you, Cornelius, or maybe Alyssa as well. Why is strip till considered equal to no till with respect to carbon sequestration? Strip till is 20 to 30% tilled after the strips are made um, and the residue is destroyed on, on those portions. Yeah, um, so from a carbon sequestration perspective, it's correct. Um, strip till has lower carbon sequestration potential as no till, but it's not that significant that we believe that it makes. Um, that we need to basically adjust the payment for a strip till practice versus no till practice, because we also, at least, um, as Alyssa mentioned, we want to keep it simple, right? And we don't want to have um, several different payment structures in place. So it's close enough, the sequestration potential, that we don't differentiate between a no tillage and a strip till. And I think further down, there was also a question regarding rich till, right? I mean, it always depends a little bit on the depth and the quota angle utilized, but in most of the cases, Rich till so should be similar to strip till and therefore would also qualify um, for the program. Great. And question for you again, Cornelius, can you discuss your outlook for the carbon marketplace? Do you see more interest from farmers to join a carbon program in the future and why? Yeah, so I mean, um, just looking at the marketplace, I think there's a significant expansion happening in the coming years, right? So the demand for carbon credits will increase exponentially and someone needs to fulfill um, the demand coming in, right? Um, I believe that more and more farmers are, are seeing that um, the carbon markets are moving into the right direction today. Um, and I think some of the farmers also have still in mind what happened with the Chicago Climate Exchange, right? That the voluntary carbon market um, didn't succeed earlier on, but times have completely changed and we can really see it in the demand coming in. So um, we see demand is increasing. So hopefully supply is increasing. Um, I think ultimately this will um, also lead to more interest in joining carbon programs in agriculture in future, because it will allow you actually, if you sign up today, to also participate in increases in prices going forward with our program. And I think this, uh, this is a very important point that it doesn't mean if you sign up today that the current um, payment structure will be there for the next 10 years. If carbon prices increase by five times, probably also your payment will go up significantly um, at the same pace. Um, so I think there's more and more interest coming also from farmers to join a carbon program in future. And I would really encourage everyone to consider it right now, just due to the fact, as also Alyssa mentioned, there are certain additionality requirements, which at some point might be difficult in certain counties or states um, to still fulfill from, from a common practice implementation. So I think the time is now to consider it, um, and our program will allow you to participate in pricing upsides going forward. 
great. That was going to be my follow-up. We sometimes get the question, shouldn't I wait until the price goes up? But because of those additionality requirements, the answer is really no, because you could lose your eligibility window um, and you'll, you'll reap the benefits of the increase in market. So great answer. Um, when it comes to soil sampling, is there an option to have the current provider do more sampling for fertility purposes or use the current samples for fertility? Maybe a question for you, Alyssa. Yeah, I can, I can just answer to diversify. So Cornelius isn't answering everything. Um, yeah, so right now we do not have the capabilities to do that. And that's, you know, just a logistical um, kind of challenge for us. Also, you know, the way we're sampling is very specific to the requirements of fulfilling the needs for our carbon space. It's not necessarily going to overlap with your needs from a fertility management standpoint, but um, we definitely hear that feedback. It's on our mind to think through how we could offer this as part of a service or a benefit to the program. Um, and so we'll continue to evaluate the potential to do that in the future. And will the growers see any results of the soil sampling? that we do do on the field? Our goal is yes. Um, again, it's a bit of a logistical issue at the moment. So we hope to be able to provide that to growers that are in our program so they have visibility into that data as well. Great. Awesome. So quick question that I will reiterate um, from a grower. So if I strip till for 2022 year and 2023, I do not qualify. Um, that is not the case. Like Alyssa said, if you've adopted since um, October of 2021 for the, so for those two seasons that you mentioned, you will qualify. How many years is the contract for? Bethany, do you wanna take that one? Yep, <clears throat> excuse me. So the total um, payable years is 10 years um, plus that 10 year retention period. So for example, if you enrolled um, your field for a 2021 practice, you would be eligible for 10 years of payment that first year. So basically next, um, we'll call it late fall time frame. you would potentially receive that one year of historic payment plus the current year. So technically that's two years, um, kind of in that first year, you would be eligible for eight more payable years um, after that. And then we ask from a permanent standpoint that Alyssa um, alluded to kind of in the beginning that you would maintain those practices for a, another 10 years. Excuse me. And what we're trying to do is that if there is still carbon credits that are being generated at that time, um, we would try and make those payable if, if um, credits were being generated. But at this time, that's just an, an unknown. Great. Um, how about, am I eligible for bare carbon if I have a CSP contract? It, yes. So if you are in a CSP program, you would be eligible in that annual attestation. We do request that you um, would call that out as to which fields are enrolled in that program. There are um, some logistical things involved with um, certain programs like that when it comes to carbon registries. Great. Um, and then which registration body will be used for carbon credits? Vera, Gold Standard, others? For you, Cornelius? Yeah, so in the first step, we will uh, utilize Vera. And um, ultimately, our goal is to be registry agnostic. So we are also looking at other registries going forward. But yeah, the first one will be Vera. Great. And can we share what's the price Bayer is receiving, regardless if Bayer chooses to sell the credit? I'm not quite sure if I understand the question, because if we choose not to sell, we don't get anything. <laughs> so, um, but basically, um, I think we are close to the prices which we mentioned earlier, right? So prices are trading around the $20, $25 mark at the moment. And we believe that this is a feasible price to achieve in the current market um, for the high quality credits which we can offer. Great. Um, so if I have strip tilled before 2022, I do not qualify. Again, it goes back to that exact switch date. Um, if you started that practice of strip till after October 1st of 2021, you do qualify. Um, the, the key point here is that you must, 
enroll in this calendar year. So as soon as we hit January 1, that window of look back will change. So we encourage you to enroll before the end of the month. And then before the end of the month, you also get up to a $2,000 enrollment bonus. So this is fully in addition to the 6 6 12 or the $5 per acre offer. Um, so definitely take a look at your eligibility via that link in the chat or the QR code. Let's see here. Um, we have a, a scenario. We have a 600 acre farm. Could we enroll the entire far farm, even though it might take several years to adopt cover crops over the entire farm? They'd probably start with 100 acres to make sure they understand the costs and benefits and assume we would only be paid on the acres in cover crops. Bethany, you I can take, take that one. Yep. Um, so I think that one of the benefits of our program is, is working with Climate Field View. So when you enroll, you immediately connect that Climate Field View account, which brings in your field boundaries. And so you have the flexibility to enroll um, the fields that you want to enroll in the program will just, you know, leaving those other fields as unenrolled. So it's really up to you uh, which acres you choose to enroll um, and then those practices even within that. So for example, if I wanted to no-till on grandma's 80, but on dad's 40, I wanted to try cover crops. You know, those are two different practices you could be potentially eligible for and how our program is really flexible in that sense at the field level. Great, thanks. Um, and we have a few comments about, hey, I'm an early adopter and I've been doing this for a while. Um, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed in this or how do I, how long do I have to be off of my current qualifying program before I can qualify? Someone can share kind of what we see for, for early adopters in the future with foreground. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, and this is um, probably my biggest issue with this space as well. It's really frustrating because ultimately we want to be sure that early adopters are acknowledged and rewarded and also that they help us in this process of getting new farmers to transition as well. So one goal with Bear Foreground is to help address some of that. And so one um, today, what we have to offer is definitely bearforeground.com. You can enroll for free. And with that, it unlocks those benefits that Bethany um, highlighted. So if you're looking at buying a new strip till equipment, you could receive a discount. If you're interested in a Field View Plus subscription, you could get a free subscription with your um, foreground membership. So those are just some of our offers today, but also I wanna highlight our revenue potential. And again, some of the areas in which we are expanding from a business perspective to find new opportunities that may actually allow um, folks who are already doing these practices to participate. So if you think of an example, like a label that could include a low carbon uh, product that's sourced from ingredients that you're producing on the farm, um, if we just take that carbon intensity or, or how much carbon is being sequestered or released based on your practices and tie it into that end product, there's a possibility that that data in itself is going to be valuable and that that value chain partner will be willing to pay that or pass that on to the grower. So we are hoping that we can start to bring some of these opportunities forward. And again, that's where Bayer Foreground is going to give you that first view and that first look at those opportunities, um, as well as with understanding where your fields are located, we'll be able to bring those um, you know, opportunities quickly to you uh, based on where you're located. So again, we definitely understand this constraint in this space, um, and we really would like to just encourage you to spend some time on BayerForeground.com um, and see what opportunities may come forward for you. Great, thanks, Alyssa. Um, why does Bayer pay for the practice implementation and not the outcome generated? Uh, maybe Cornelius, you can take this one. I think it comes down again to um, giving some certainty to the grower itself, right? Because we know that actual sequestration can be very different acre by acre, county by county, state by state. And we want to make it very transparent and upfront um, what we are able to pay as a fixed per acre payment. And then basically later on sharing the upside. Instead of basically telling you, hey, um, we'll try to generate as many credits as we can, but then ultimately coming back to you and saying, oh, it was actually only 0.1 metric ton, for example, 
which basically is a very low payment then for you. Uh, so we want to make it very transparent and, and, and easy to, to plan. And that's why we have decided to go with a per acre payment. Great. I will add that when we did market research last year on a thousand growers, we also saw that 67% prefer to be paid by practice. So we decided to keep that going forward in addition to the reasons Cornelius mentioned. Um, so if we can go over time, we will continue to answer questions. Speakers, if you have to jump off, um, just let me know, but otherwise we'll continue answering questions so we have it on the recording and anyone that's able to stay on is more than welcome to. So one about the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, how do you expect the, the act to change payments to farmers on 1125 when price changes to $85 per metric ton? And how does payment um, per metric ton compare um, to payment per acre that for Bayer compared to payment per acre to grower to ensure the grower is treated fairly? So roughly, how do we translate um, the value back to the grower is that second question. Yeah, so the Inflation Reduction Act direct, doesn't directly impact the voluntary carbon market per se, but it's more thought as a tax incentive for large developers if they are looking at carbon capture, for example, in industrial and power generation facilities. So this $85, I think, coming out of a 45Q incentive. Um, however, we also believe that this can have a positive impact also on agriculture, um, because I think overall it raises the pricing for carbon emissions. And hopefully this will also have an impact on the voluntary carbon market. And again, where we would then basically share any um, upsides um, with you ultimately. Perfect. Um, then we had a question on, say the grower is not currently qualifying by practice. Um, how long would they have to conventionally till the soil to make no-till a new practice again um, if they wanted to pause that practice to become eligible? Alyssa, do you want to take this one and maybe about the benefits or the, the cons of, of doing that? So from my perspective as a sustainable agronomist, I would highly not recommend um, going back to a conventional till uh, just to qualify for a program. Um, you know, I'd be happy and we, our team would be happy to discuss specific opportunities with this individual if they would want to follow up um, with their specific scenario. So again, you could maintain that base uh, practice of no-till or strip-till and add in cover crops if you're in an eligible county. Um, and also, you know, again, there's potential going into the future where you may be a, a revenue opportunity may come to you that's going to allow you to continue to maintain those practices, um, submit data for a price per acre or potentially have a higher uh, value on your end product due to its being able to be tied to a lower carbon intensity. So I would highly recommend not to go back to conventional till if you're already a no-till, strip-till grower, um, but definitely sign up for foreground or reach out to us and our team to see what other opportunities we may have for you. Great. And then um, for Cornelius, how are practices verified to confirm a producer's compliance? Yeah, so today we are actually asking for evidence documentation to be submitted to us, which can be as simple as a cover crop receipt or uh, a picture of your no tillage um, or strip till equipment. Um, Going forward, we want to move from one more to um, remote sensing. Today, I think the quality is not there. I'm sorry for the docs in the background, so this is a live recording. Um, the remote sensing is not there yet, but we hope that actually going forward, we can rely more and more on remote sensing instead of asking you for additional evidence documents, which is just time consuming on both ends. Great. Um, maybe a couple of questions that I gathered from the chat along the way as well. Um, can we share if how the geography may or may not expand in the future? Any talking points about those people in states that aren't eligible? Plus, I think you mentioned some some points about foreground. If you want to reiterate, yeah, I'll reiterate that Bayer Foreground is open to the entire continental United States as long as you have or are willing to sign up for a Field View account for free. Um, and so we would like to encourage. Um, folks to do that. 
today we do have limited offers, both from our carbon perspective and also other programs. And that's primarily due to uh, several different factors, one of which is uh, the actual requirements that Cornelius and I both covered around additionality, crops, rotations, et cetera. There's a possibility we could expand our carbon program specifically in the future if we were to add in new practices to help um, overcome some of that additionality component. The other way in which we may expand our offerings is through um, programs such as like creating an inset offer or other value chain partnership offers that have different geographic footprints um, and cropping systems that we could include. So there's multiple ways we're trying to expand. We are again committed to trying to create as many offers as possible for the entire continental United States if possible. Awesome. I think that closes out our question. So I'll just wrap us up with a few key slides as reminders. So um, as Alyssa mentioned, we have a team of sustainable systems agronomists that are here to support you in considering the practice. If you've already changed recently and have questions or wanna learn more about the program, please feel free to contact the sustainable systems agronomist in your area. So you can see them broken out by region here and their emails. Um, or you can contact our customer success team directly on the phone um, and they will be dedicated to the carbon program and, and be a good resource or at carbonprogram at bayer.com. So to really close us out, we wanna say a huge thank you for joining, taking an hour out of your morning plus to be with us and learn about carbon. Um, we're excited to hear from you if you do have questions if you indicated that you want to learn more, we will reach out. Likely that your agronomist will reach out to you so we can answer any remaining questions or help find what's the right fit for you. But as of today, everyone on the call will qualify for foreground and get some free benefits. It's a 60 second or less enrollment process if you have a field view account. So go ahead and scan the QR code to learn more or enroll. We also drop the link in the chat if you want to take a look. Um, Appreciate all the engagement today, all the questions, and hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Um, there should be a survey that pops up. Uh, go ahead and fill that out if you would, please. But um, have a great day.